Hi, and welcome to this episode of I've Got This Kid. I'm your host, Sharina Williams, licensed speech and language pathologist, homeschooling mom of two, wife of one, here to share everything, speech, language, play, development, and all that other stuff that falls in between. We have an exciting show for you today. We're going to tackle academia through play. And oftentimes we think that learning comes from either the flashcard or the textbook, but I'm going to challenge you, you, to think outside of the box because I want you to see how learning can occur naturally with a little bit of intentionality. So we're going to break this down into three parts. The foundation, what you need to know, the insider scoop, other stuff you need to know, and then the practical stuff. And then finally, we're going to finish things up with the outcome because we kind of have to understand these processes in order to know why we're doing what we're doing or else it just ain't going to work flat out. It ain't going to work. So first things first, learning starts from the moment little sugar enters into the world. There's even research that learning begins while they're in the belly around 30 weeks, but it seriously does start soon as they come out. Not only can they hear, but they can see and they can hear everyone around. They can see everyone around and they're observing the things that are going on around them. And then those face-to-face interactions that you're having with them when you're going, hello, you're so cute. I love you. And they're, ah, da, 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 da. And then you say back, yes, I know, yes, because you're so smart. And they're like, ah, da, 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 da. or if you do like the funny sounds, like you, and then they try to do it back to you. That's learning. They're learning how to communicate back and forth. They're learning how to listen for different sounds and try to imitate and duplicate those sounds. They're learning facial expressions. So if you are like, oh, oh my gosh, you made a stinky. They're like, oh my gosh, I made a stinky. Even if they don't know what that means, they're still learning through those face-to-face interactions. And when they babble, when you talk back and forth to them, they start to understand that, hey, if mom or dad talk to me or I make a sound and they make a sound back and I make a sound again, then they make a sound back. And there's some sounds that are pretty familiar that I hear over and over and over again. So that's where the word building comes in. And so those face-to-face interactions are important because, again, it's starting as soon as they enter into the world. So we know that engagement starts early and we want to be proactive early. And here's why. It's always easier to engage when sugars are young and start that play relationship from day one. And not just the, you know, babbling back and forth and having super fun together, but even like the play relationship. Play starts pretty early for them. So, you know, they have like the little mobiles and usually the toys come off. And so if they're like shaking that around, then maybe you're shaking that around too. And then maybe they throw it and then you pick it up and you give it back to them. And then they throw it again and then you pick it up and you give it back to them. What you're doing during this time is building their attention because you guys are doing together, right? But you're also focusing on this thing that has both of your attention. And so by building that attention for them, they learn early on how to pay attention to one thing And as things become more complex and more complex things are introduced, they're able to pay attention and handle more complex things. But it really does start with like the little stuff. Or if you have like one of the little ring toys and they're like bashing them around and they can't quite get it on and you guys kind of do it together and you're like moving their hand to put it on and you're going as it goes down, they're totally into that. And not only will they be into that, but again, They're attending to what's in front of them. They're focusing on you. They're focusing on what's in front of them. And that's natural play. Even doing just sounds, silly sounds, silly words, just doing silly is a way to just foster play and get that attention built up and going. It also teaches you during this time the type of learner that they are. You can find out pretty early or at least get an idea how they gravitate towards things, right? Some kiddos are super hands-on and they want to touch everything 
and they want to get to everything. And this can happen like while they're infants. Like if you notice they're like reaching and pulling or they're like really focused on trying to get the toy on or they're focused on trying to move their body, that tells you something. Like if they're that kiddo that sits down and are like trying to really get that ring on, we'll go back to the ring, then you know that this is a kiddo who likes to sit down and focus on whatever it is that's in front of them until the task is completed. Now, if you have that other little sugar who likes to take the toy and chuck it across the room and wants you to go get it and they do it over and over and over again, Chances are you have that kiddo that loves for the engagement or or it can also mean that they're not interested in that toy anymore. It can mean one of two things, but you can learn something from that. Also, also, if sugar kind of shows that they're not necessarily interested in the toy and they are more interested in moving around, then you know you have a sugar who likes movement more than they like the toys. They'll show you during this age. And so You can kind of be taking inventory as to like what's going on, what they're into, what they're, you know, kind of not into, their favorite little thing that they love. Or they might just be a talker and want to kind of sit there and babble back and forth with you. It just depends. But knowing these things and paying attention to these things helps you as the world changer build activities that are around their interest. Because the more that you find things that are that are like surrounded around their interests, the more they're going to do what? Pay attention, attend, and focus on what's in front of them. Versus if you show them 50 things or have a room of 100 things where they can't kind of engage or figure out like, which thing do I go to? I'm not quite sure what to do with this. I just kind of see colors everywhere. And I, I just, I don't know. It, it might be a little bit much. But if you meet them where they are, it becomes easier and easier to teach the harder concepts. And so if you tackle the easy stuff and they're like, hey, I'm good with mom doing this with me, I'm good with dad doing these things with me, then they will not only thaw out, but when you introduce new things that may be a little bit more difficult, like let's say the toy where it has like all the windy little parts and you have to get the rings around from one side to the other, that could be pretty complicated, right? Especially for a little one and they're ready to like lose it because they're like, ah, this toy won't, you know, the things won't move. And they start banging it and crashing it around. And you're like, okay, it's time to take this away. But again, if you build up that play relationship early through interaction face-to-face, through doing hands-on things together, and through movement, then again, it becomes easier for harder things to be introduced and for them to be willing to let you help them through those things. So once you build up that play relationship, then you can again build in learning. When you're with your sugar, when they're super young, it's not necessarily crucial to be thinking about like learning in a pre-academic sense. And what I mean by that is that I'm not necessarily concerned if you're teaching them colors or numbers or letters. It's okay to build it into the play if it's around, but not necessarily having that as the primary focus. Because if you think about it, you can build in so much more language by talking about what's going on by talking about what you're doing, by giving them adjectives for expressions and things like that. And so you want to use language as a tool, especially for like, I'm talking about 24 months and younger, and even sometimes up to like 36 months, you you really want to focus on using language as a tool to, to describe what's happening, right? So if I'm playing with stackable blocks, right? And I'm saying up, up, up. And then I push it over and say down. Then they're going to understand every time that I take an object and go up, 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 that it can eventually come down. Um, If I were to take those same blocks and make a dinosaur and then say my dinosaur is going to go into the land and eat, Rawr, rawr, rawr. time to eat rawr, rawr. you're he's eating the leaves okay now it's time for dinosaur to go run 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 he's chasing the other dinosaurs 
So I'm describing what's going on instead of just saying, okay, I put this red block here, blue block, what color is this? I put this yellow block here, what color is this? I'm making it engaging. And so by engaging in that way and making it come real for them, now I'm kind of building up imagination and they're making like the connection that not only is she teaching me how to use my imagination, I can use my imagination and I can act it out in real time versus only thinking to myself, every time I see this block, it's a red block, but I'm not quite sure how to navigate the block or what to do with the block, or maybe I don't know how to play with the toy. So now I'm chucking the toy, not necessarily for the cause and effect interaction, just because it's more so because I have no clue how to engage in this way. And so the, we want to be careful with that. We want to really be careful with that because we want to make sure that it's fun for them and also fun for us because after two or three minutes of asking and drilling for colors, if they're not responding, then guess what sets in? Frustration and anger. And oh my gosh, you're not paying attention to me. And oh my gosh, you, you don't like me or whatever those things are. They just like to play by themselves. And that's not always true. You just need a different way to engage. And again, that's why we start from day one. Another way that we can build in learning is by teaching early concepts within the play. So instead of making it be like the primary focus, we, we put it into or integrate it into what we're doing, right? So I know just a second ago, I said, focus on actions and don't focus on colors. I'm still saying that. So what I mean is say we got those same blocks and we're stacking. And I can say, instead of just saying, what color is this? I can change my language and say, red block go up, blue block up, green block up, orange block up, and now they go down. I'm not drilling. I'm still teaching actions. It's still fun. It's still interactive. It's still engaging. And then I could be get I could get kind of savvy, especially once language starts coming in. And I can ask, well, can mommy have the green block? Do you want the red block or the blue block? Right? And so again, it takes the drill away. And I'm still looking for colors, but I'm not looking for colors in a way to where like this is just the focus of what we're doing. I can also do it with numbers. Instead of saying, what number is this? What number is this? What number is this? I can say, okay, I'm going to build my red block, green block, blue block, all up, up, up. Let's see. How many do I have? One, two, three, four, five. And that, you know, toddlers, they're still kind of shady with their numbers. <laughs> they're not quite there yet. And so don't be surprised if they're like, one, three, ten, four, six. They know their numbers. They just don't kind of know the order of things yet and that's okay because guess what next time you play you're going to do it again in a different way maybe we're not counting blocks this time maybe we're counting how many cars okay sugar i want you to bring not all of the cars i just want five cars because now you're managing the cleanup when you tell them five cars versus the whole bin of cars and then the whole bin goes like this, and then it's the cleanup party, which turns into the cleanup fight. Hey, I'm trying to save you guys. I'm trying to save you guys from argument. So if you say five cars, right, then you can help them count. Okay, which five cars do you want? Pick one. This one, one. Which other one? Two. Oh, that's a lovely one. How about the next one? Three. Here comes the next one. Four. The other one, final one. Five. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five cars. Now, what color car do I get? Do I get the orange one or the yellow one? Do I get the red one or the blue one? I'm building in the concepts. It's still fun. And I haven't put a flash card in anybody's face and I haven't drilled anybody at this point. And I can still build in the prepositions because they need those. They really, really need those at this point. Where's your bottle? On the table. Where are you going? In the room. And so they're able to generalize those prepositions that they learn in play into real life. You're a master now at building Sugar's vocabulary. So here we go. So we're teaching early concepts still. And so let's say we decide that we want to focus on letters. Well, that's a tricky one. Unless you have like letters around, I really wouldn't fool with it. But 
if you do say like, I know shaving cream is all the rage to where you could take some shaving cream and put it on the table. You can even add food coloring to it and you can do letters that way. I still wouldn't make that the primary focus of play, but it's, it's not a bad activity because then they're getting like some sensory and some like tactile hands on stuff. And it's kind of fun and it's kind of messy. And you can build other things, but I've also seen like blocks with the letters, puzzles with the letters, um, those kinds of things you can still build in the same concepts. So instead of just saying, what letter is this? And then you want to put it in the inset, inset it into the puzzle. You can say, okay, A goes in, B goes in, and you're building up more language versus just asking them that single question of what letter is this? Instead of answering you with one word, if you say B goes in, guess how many words you have? B goes in. That's three words. And remember, they're still imitating you. And so if they consistently hear that letter and goes in, not only are they telling you what it is, but they're describing the action that they are doing. B goes in. Oh no, B came out. Where's, where's B going to go? Are we going to make BB hop, 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 hop? And we can be silly in that way and have them do things in a way, again, that's engaging for them. Because if you're silly along with the plague and you're not super focused on, oh my gosh, we've got 26 letters out. And so we need to get them right back in, in the order. Then that can get a little dry after a while. So just liven things up. Okay. You're going to take these letters. Those are yours. And I'm going to take these letters. These are mine. And we are going to put them in a bin and we're going to go on a letter scavenger hunt. So we put the letters in the bin and you have your bin and I have my bin. And maybe we put like some beans in there, like some dried beans to really make it a scavenger hunt and mix the letters in there or some sand. All of these things usually people have in their cabinets, minus the sand, minus the sand. You got to go buy that or go to a beach. But, but you know what I mean? Like you could put the letters in there and um, take it out. Oh my gosh, what did you get? I got an X. X is going boop in. X is going boop out. X is going to walk, 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 walk to a spot. Whatever X is going to do, that's happening in real time. And you're teaching the language and they're going to try to model that. Another way that you can teach learning through play is describing gender differences. This is when you have your dolls and your bears and your toys and you're trying to teach sugar the difference between boy and girl um so it could be one of those things to where you could say okay he's going here bear bear he's gonna go over here mrs bear bear is gonna go over there mommy bear bear whatever you want to call bear bear but it kind of helps with like getting the gender differences in check and also teaching them i me you he and she so He's going to sit down here. She is going to sit down there. Let's give them something to eat. What would she like to eat? What would he like to eat? What would you like to eat? I would like to eat. And again, for toddlers, they still might get the, the pronouns mixed up a little bit. The I's and the U's. Some of them might get that a little mixed up. Keep modeling it because soon as you start making a big deal out of it, it's going to confuse the situation even more. I've seen it a million times and I've learned from my own mistakes. So don't confuse the situation. Just make sure that you're just modeling it over and over again. Oh no, he's going to get in the car and he's going, going, going around the track. And now it's her turn and she's going to go, 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 go around the track. And it's so much fun and everybody's having a great time. So that's how we kind of play that out and get that going to where we put it in real time. We put it in live action. Again, we're opening up their imagination. We're building up their language. We're sneaking in concepts. We still haven't shown anybody a flashcard and everybody is pretty happy so far. The next thing that we can do to put some academia into our play is enact fillings. We can use our language to enact fillings. So let's say we still have the stuffed toy still out and the, and the doll still out. And maybe sugar is having a hard time understanding people's feelings or empathizing. We can take our toys, our dolls and 
say sugar accidentally knocks him down. Change your disposition. Oh no! Oh no! Poor bear is crying. What should we do for poor bear? Oh my gosh! Is she gonna be okay? Is bear okay? Can you check on him and see if he's gonna be okay? And and pick him up and coddle and show like what those feelings of sad looks like and hurt looks like and mad looks like because sometimes those those feelings have to be taught in real time and not just in a book and not just on a card um, and not just through experiences. Sometimes we have to like really get in there and show and enact what these feelings are and what that stuff means and what it looks like. The final way we can sneak in academia learning through play is early addition and subtraction. So I talked about rote counting. Rote counting is one, two, three, four, five. Rote counting. Versus counting for, I'm going to add something to it. I'm going to take away something from it, right? And it doesn't have to be complex. There doesn't have to be any picture symbols or anything like that. It just needs to be your words and some stuff around, right? So let's say we have our same dolls out. And we want to know how many we have all together. Well, on my side, I have one bear, one Barbie, and one G.I. Joe. And on your side, you have, hmm, you have a strawberry shortcake, an Elmo, and maybe a Miss Piggy. Don't ask me where that came from. Let's see how many we have all together. One, two, three. Hmm, three, and I have one, two, three. Let's put them together. Oh, we have six. What if we took two of them away? How many do we have now? Wow, we only have four. But I think I want my friends back, so I'm going to put two of them back, and now we have four, five, six. Ta-da! That's for the older kids. I would save that for the older kids or if you have a sugar who's really into like counting things and, and you want to engage them in a way but kind of pull them out of just counting and add a little bit of uh, meat to it, then that's a way that you can do that by putting things together and taking them away. Okay, mommy wants, okay, we only can have 10 and you can have five. So how many does mommy get to have? You don't know. Well, then count. Let's see. You've got your five over there. And I've got, let me see. One, let's count together. Two, three, four, five. Okay. All together, 10. Or you can keep counting up. Either way. Doesn't bother me. Which would look like six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then you can say the equation. Five plus five is 10. Wow. How cool is that? What if I only want an eight? And mm, how many should we take away? Let's see. We have 10. So let's count backwards. Nine, eight. We have to take away two. Oh, no. Fun stuff. <laughs> you can tell what goes on in my house or what used to go on in my house. Uh, my kiddos are much older now, so we don't we don't do as much of that. But I do kind of bring out the silly when I'm introducing stuff when I know it's going to be interesting. We'll say interesting. So I want to give you guys the insider scoop. The real deal about the learning process in general, because sometimes we do feel like learning and academia automatically means school. And in some senses, the academic process does happen in traditional school for most kiddos, or Montessori school, or private school, or public school, or homeschool. But academia like academics, when you're thinking about that, we're thinking about the three R's, we're thinking about math, and we're thinking about writing. But if you really truly think about the steps that I just took you through, those concepts are being built into what you're naturally going to prepare your sugar for, right? And so I want you guys to know that learning does not start at school. It really does start at home. And for academia, it, it really is like a set of milestones for the general population that prepares everyone, right? It's great level milestones. And they're, they're perfect for, for the needs and for suiting their needs. But as far as like 
developing the imagination and the critical thinking skills and the reasoning and the problem solving, the earlier that those things start to happen, the more we expand and prepare our sugar's mind when it is time to tackle the textbooks. But we know it's not quite time to tackle the textbooks at like four and under, like we're really not tackling that kind of stuff yet. But again, we can still teach those concepts in a way to where it it is real life for them and it's meaningful for them, and they can make a connection outside of a textbook page. Like, I've seen these numbers, I've heard these numbers, I've written these numbers, I've seen these colors, I understand what this means, I've, I have understand these words, I understand these sounds that go along with that, and now I'm prepared to learn what I need to learn to go to the next level. And so sometimes academia can be limited, when you're thinking about the schoolhouse and going into the schoolhouse. And so there may be things that you can teach sugar or things that are interesting to them that don't necessarily happen within the school. There may be activities that may happen that are outside of the school. And so, like, for example, I was watching a documentary yesterday on Charles Schultz, and he is the maker of Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And when he was giving like his, his story, he was saying how terrible of a student he was. He was horrible in school, but his parents both knew that he had an interest and was a masterful artist. Like he could draw, he could always draw. And sometimes that's not accessible in school. And so what his dad would do was he would go to different newspaper stands, to different stores and buy different newspapers, I think four in total, so he could have different comic strips to read to like nurture that craft. And so I say all that to say, like, think about that when you're engaging sugar, that everything may not happen within the classroom, but there's things that we need in the classroom that are necessary in order to get us where we need to go down the long run. And let's just say Charles Schultz's parents decided that they didn't want to, you know, nurture his craft or pay attention to what he was good at or make the assumption that he was going to get it in school. And we would have lost out on learning about Snoopy and watching him fly on his doghouse and pretending like he's in war and Charlie Brown, like being that relatable kid that always felt rejected and all of those other things that we go through as, as kiddos. So I say all that to say, just be careful and think about that as you're going through these processes of what my sugar is supposed to be getting and what my role is outside of a roof over their head, food in their mouth, safety and love. So that means that we don't always need a flashcard or a school book. Like that's not always our role as world changers. Sometimes it's finding out what our sugar is gifted at and what they're good at and what they gravitate towards. Remember, it can start as little as as an infant, where we start kind of picking up on what they're good at and what they're interested in. And we can nurture that instead of like giving a concrete guide of 300 pages of textbook or feeling like they're not going to be a great student because they haven't mastered certain things that happen later on down the line. And so we don't, again, we want to try to find other things that are outside of that classroom, other things that um, that they may not have access to, to ensure that they are getting what they need. And you're the one who's there walking them along and giving them like the cheerleader pom-poms of like, great, good job. I knew you could do it. I knew you were great. Oh my gosh, let's go find these things. And watching them spark and finding that thing that makes them spark. So I talked about toys earlier. And now we're going to get into the practical because I definitely talked about toys and a lot of the things that I kind of talked about with using academia through play had to do with toys. But world changers, toys are not an end all be all toys. You don't need a 100 toys in a room in order for sugar to have a magical childhood experience. Imagination some fun and some intentionality will get you to where you need to go. I'd rather you have a few things that really spark their interest versus a thousand things that they're just 
messing up your house with. And it's toys all over the floor. And you're like, why is this happening to my life? There's toys everywhere. And they're not necessarily playing with them, but they're there. And oh my gosh, right? And so some of the things that I am a firm believer in, like every household should have a set of just to kind of see where kids go and to give them diversity and variety. Blocks. I love blocks. Cars. Puzzles. Mr. Potato Head. Baby dolls. Stackable rings. Cardboard books. These are the non-play toys that you can't necessarily buy in a store, but are great tools for play. Cardboard boxes. I love cardboard boxes. I've talked about that in another show. Paper towel rolls are a friend. Toilet paper rolls, recycled jars and recycled cans. Not recycled cans that are rusted and it looks like you're going to need a tetanus shot after. Like you opened up a can of something, you washed out the can really good, you made sure that the ridges were not um, sharp and nobody was going to hurt themselves. Cans. There's so many things that you can do with those. The possibilities are endless. Let's start off with like, Half of my Barbie cars when I was a kid was made out of my mom's shoe boxes. I kid you not. It was a fight for mom's shoe boxes. And guess how I kept her in? Because you know, if you put Barbie in, you're like, how does she sit up? Well, I put her arm over the side like this, and then I'd strap her in with my grandfather's rubber bands from his newspaper. Winning. And if I was really feeling good about myself, I would design her car, and I would give my markers and my crayons, and I would give her a Jeep. Or I would give her a a Corvette or a Honda or whatever I was into that day because shoe boxes seem to come through the house a lot and she never fits in the kid size shoe boxes. Barbie does not fit in those, but she definitely fits in women's shoe boxes and probably men. You probably invite Ken for a ride, but that's how I would roll. We would even create back seats for the kids. Remember they came out with Ken or excuse me, Skipper. Remember the little Skipper, make a little spot in the back seat for Skipper, a little divider. What do you use? More cardboard more rubber bands. I knew no different. And I was happy as can be. But that sparked creativity for me and imagination for me. And you can do the same for sugar by just modeling this kind of play. I was just that quirky kid that would go and kind of figure out stuff for myself. Nobody necessarily modeled that. But that was my jam, right? And they would give me all the cardboard I wanted. Cardboard boxes are a friend. What can't you make in cardboard boxes? I've watched, um, I've watched kiddos make race car tracks, cars for themselves, houses for themselves, small houses for their toys. If you add a hot glue gun into that, then you have a whole nother situation to where they're building massive structures and all of this stuff. Imagination. Paper towel rolls are great for sword fights because nobody gets hurt. And especially if you have a little boy around who likes to move and is active, then swords with paper towel rolls are your friend. Um, again, building houses. If you have a hot glue gun around, you can build these massive towers and structures. And all of a sudden you have a place that looks like Rome and you're like, oh my gosh, this was not built overnight. Dooch. But <laughs> collecting paper towel rolls, we go through them a lot in our house because we go through them a lot in our house. And it's not always eco-friendly or responsible, but we do upcycle those rolls for purposes such as sword fights and other craziness like that. Toilet paper rolls. I've seen those used for holders. If you put like six of them together like this, three on one side and three on the others, the art supplies can go in there. I've seen toys get shoved in there, little dolls and get rolled. And all of a sudden dolls are having a race who can go the fastest. Your imagination is the only thing that limits you. You can also use, again, the paper towel rolls or the toilet paper rolls for music. What kind of sound? If you took that recycled jar and put some beans in there or put some little plastic crystal gems in there. If you shook it around or if you tapped on it, then you're teaching early music. What does that sound like? What does it look like? If you added some Dawn liquid soap or some food coloring in there, then you can make yourself one of those snowball glasses. So it's it's totally up to you. Like your imagination is the only thing that stops you from creating play. I'm sure there's things around your house that I haven't even mentioned or thought of. And these are just kind of things that I'm spitting off from the top of my head um, based on my own personal experiences and stuff that I've seen over the years. But I'd love to hear from you, World Changers. What are some of the things that you guys are using? 
What are some of the things that you guys have created that you didn't go to a store and buy, but you made and it was super fun because you know what? Other world changers would love to hear that. Post that on my social media page. I can't wait to hear from you. So world changers, play is not limited to toys. Exploration is your best friend. This is not limited to going to parks, nature trails, your neighborhood, rivers, beaches, whatever is around historical conservation sites. All of those things are your best friend for teaching concepts and teaching things that sugar may not again learn in school, but can learn from you outside of the home. What kind of plant is that? What kind of bird is that? What kind of you know, bug is that? Like there was just this big thing on the cicadas, even teaching the kids the life cycles of cicadas and us researching that, finding out that there's 17 years cicadas, 13 years cicadas, huh? Right? But going outside and reading and and exploring kind of opens up this world to where you find out about things that you may not always find out about in the classroom. And it again, sparks interest. And, and kind of guides them and navigates them in a way to where they learn that learning doesn't always happen in the classroom, but in the greater world around them. What kind of trees are native to this habitat? What is the butterfly doing? Why do I only see it certain seasons? And asking like those kinds of questions about the things that they see, the things that they smell. What is the plane doing when it drives by? Look at that car. It was going fast, fast, fast. Do you think it should be going slow, slow, slow? Oh, the car had to stop. Do you see that? There's a stop sign right there. Time for them to stop. Our turn to stop too. Now we're building in safety. And we're just doing this naturally as we go through the day. And we're not just putting this book in front of them or a flashcard in front of them. And when I say book, I mean like textbook information in front of them, not like reading books. We'll get to that a little bit later. We want to ask the right questions because we want them to start thinking. We want to start getting them to not only think about what's going on around them, but we want our little sugars to have like a healthy relationship and a healthy respect for nature and for the plants and the animals and for God's creations because it's pretty cool stuff. And so by them understanding that and by them seeing that again, the more that they see and the more that it's reinforced, the more that it's going to be real to them and the more they're going to be able to expand on that. And sometimes again, that can't happen if we're just showing the same kind of thing again and again and again. And you can expand that, that play, that outdoor explorer. You can totally expand that because guess what? As much as I love being outside and I can spend the day outside, at some point it's got it in and it's not practical to do it every single day because we have lives outside of that. And so we can expand it by going to the library, looking up books on specific topics, maybe sugar gravitated to a certain flower. Well, let's learn about other flowers. And then even asking the librarian, What flowers are native to this area? Are there any books about that? Are there any books about flowers in general? What would be interesting for sugar? You can also create an early reader by doing that because now you're taking the information that's real to them and tangible to them and showing them that, hey, I can get more information in books. I'm also, as the world changer, I'm building their attention because they're gonna sit down and read that book because they're interested in that book versus just some random book that I picked up and they're like, I don't wanna read, I don't like reading. But if you build up that interest for them and then show them a book related to it, chances are they're gonna be super engaged and they're gonna wanna know more and it's going to open up the door for them to wanna read more and learn more. You're also building up their vocabulary. Every time you go outside and explore and they learn about a new plant, a new book, a new animal, even if they run from the bugs, because my sugars are good for learning about every bug that exists, but they run from every bug they see. And I don't get it. I'm like, you know, everything about this bug, you know, it's not dangerous, but you're still running up the street like you're doing the 100 meter dash. I don't get it. I don't ask questions. I just speak my truth and keep it moving. But they know stuff about them and they can read about them and they're happy. And that's my little, that's my spiel for today about that because you can see it is a soft spot for me like I really don't get it and if somebody else goes through that I'd love to hear about it <laughs> but it's 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 hilarious anyway 
I, I digress. But it also continues to, again, build up that curiosity and that focus. So say, for example, we just learned about my son was interested in elderberry beetles. Don't ask. We went on a hike and that was what he wants to write about, elderberry beetles. And then he learned about them. But then he started asking, well, who's the predator and who's the prey? And what else do they, you know, where else are they? And what do they like to eat? And, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, OK, that's good stuff. Elderberry beetles had no clue they existed until him. But because we just take them out and we let them have at it, that's what they do. Another thing that you can do after exploring, if you don't have a huge toy supply, libraries are becoming more popular having toy lending libraries. Uh, you can rent toys at the library. You can even play with toys at some library and give them back. But you can also rent in some cases, take it home, try it out see what works for sugar if this is all kind of new to you because it's okay if you didn't start at day one as long as you get in there at some point and just start applying these these techniques then chances are sugar is going to be good to go you're going to do a great job don't worry about it don't don't have any guilt of like i didn't start who cares about that start today just start today it's fine and finally finally because you guys notice i haven't brought up anything about technology i brought nothing up about technology and that's for a reason because i'm gonna sneak that in right now towards the end watch shows that are age appropriate tv is not a bad thing technology is not a bad thing if you want to know my perspective on tv and technology that was my first episode where i talked about play and technology um i also talked about it with kyla ettinger when she came on the show so check out those episodes and you can get my full rundown on my feelings about tv and technology but you can bring learning through TV. You just have to be intentional about how you do it. I am a PBS fan. I love PBS. Public Broadcasting Station is everything to us. We watch it all the time, not just the kids, but the adults. But some of the shows that my kids enjoyed were like Wild Crest, learning about different animals, Super Y when they were preschool and younger, and Curious George, because he loves to explore. He's like that inner explorer that we all sometimes want to be and need to be to detach from like the day to day, right? And so you can take what they've learned. You can take these concepts and watch TV again to reinforce what they've learned or again to build up that imagination. Maybe instead of exploring first, we watch the show first. Oh, wow, we just watched a show on badger moles. Now let's go to the zoo. Let's go to this habitat and see badger moles in real life and see if they look anything like the cartoon and see how they really behave in real time. We know all this information about them. That's a way to do it. Maybe we could go to the library after that and pick up a book. Interesting stuff. Now we know everything we need to know about badger moles. What animal is next? What plant is next? What this is next? What flower is next? That's how we create learning experience through our play. And it's still fun. And it's still interesting. And again, you've built up all of these other areas that may not necessarily be built up if we're sticking only to textbooks and flashcards. How is this beneficial? It's beneficial because you're creating a critical thinker, a problem solver, a sugar who can reason, a sugar who can think beyond themselves and see a greater world around them, which creates more empathy, more respect, more understanding for the world around them and for the people around them. You also create an explorer and just something about the idea of a sugar being able to go outside and watch them spark up when they see something new or something that has not been presented before or something that they've seen before, but they see it in a different way. It's real learning. It's learning in real time. And the brain is making different neural connections versus if they're just looking at a picture book. Now, again, if they see it in real time and see the tangible and then have the book to reinforce, then that's like double win. That's best case scenario. Your sugar will also, again, know how to look beyond a textbook and look beyond the information in a textbook. Like school is only 10 months, traditional school, 10 months in a year, which means you have books this thick that you have to get through in 10 months of a year. It's really hard to go deep with any information or any text or any concepts, especially when you start talking about the STEM 
the science and the technology and the engineering and, and even the math in some cases. It's really hard to go deep if you only have a little bit of time and a bunch of kids around and my hat's off to teachers because they make it happen. But for you at home, having that additional time to really be able to go deeper with the information, go harder into that information. I guarantee if you're doing that, your child's educator is going to love you because teachers are some of the smartest people who are given the least amount of credit for what they know and what they do. I cannot overemphasize that, that they really are. But if you're bringing sugar to the scene prepared and ready to think and learn and explore, then they can go deeper with the information instead of kind of teaching to the middle um, to where, you know, the people on the bottom are barely keeping up and the people on top are like, I'm kind of bored. I need a little bit more. And so you can do that for your, your child's teacher. You can do that world changer and help them out. Not only do you do that by helping them think beyond a textbook, you also build a strong communicative relationship where you're sharing your thoughts and ideas. That starts young. Starting a strong communicative relationship, and I mean just talking back and forth and sharing your thoughts and ideas and your feelings about stuff, not just like, how was your day today? Fine. What did you do? Played. Great. Enjoy your day. Hats off to you. But really going deeper and being like, I had a day. Why? Well, remember when they were two and you were sitting down with them and saying, oh my gosh, how does baby feel? It fell down. How do you think he feels? And you building up that relationship, it makes it easier when they get older to ask those same kind of questions without it being weird or awkward. Because being vulnerable in and of itself, it comes through intimacy. And if they don't have that relationship with you to where they feel like they can just kind of pour out and you haven't necessarily modeled your feelings, then they probably are going to have a hard time getting it out unless they're just like that wild card kid that just is like, this is how I feel. And you're like, I don't know what to do with this kid. I don't know how to relate. So just keeping in mind that your relationship as far as your communication will be so much stronger and you'll know where they're coming from and they'll be more vulnerable to tell you like, this is where I feel good in school. This is where I don't. This is where I'm feeling good in life. This is where I'm not. And you can help them through that, right? From day one. And finally, you can learn your differences and your similarities. So I'll give you an example. I am super emotional. I am super emotional. I am a hugger. I am a hugger. My mom was not. <laughs> and so she had to learn how to adapt to having an emotional kid who's a hugger. And she worked through it and, and she's fine. And I had to work through like, she don't want hugs all the time. And it's not because she doesn't like me or love me. It's just like, that's not her jam. She's going to be like, you smell like outside. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? <laughs> but, but learning your similarities and differences are so important. But we also learn our similarities and differences as far as how we handle life, how we enjoy exploring the world around us, what activities we like. And so that way it doesn't become so one-sided to where it's always either her way or always either my way. Because you have to compromise in these relationships so you guys won't check out on each other. So I don't know who that was for. That was totally off of my notes, but that was for you out there, whoever needed to hear that. But find that balance with your similarities and, and, and differences because we have to work through that too. Like in, in so many ways, my mom and I are alike. In so many ways, we are completely different and we had to like learn how to like, make it work for us. And I do that for my sugars as well. My daughter loves art, paints all over everything that she owns, everything, pajamas included. There's paint everywhere. And I don't like to be dirty. And so I have to find the compromise of if we paint or color, like it has to be in a very contained space. So I'm not getting too dirty or I have to wear really like playful clothes, like my outside clothes. I gotta wear my outside clothes in order to engage her in that way. For my son, he likes hands-on. He knows he's not patient with me with that at all. And I don't mind. That's our understanding. But for the stuff that we do enjoy together, I'm super active. He's super active. And so that's our jam. And so 
we know the stuff that we have in common and we know the stuff that we kind of don't. And I'll get in there and ask questions, but he doesn't expect me to spend like three days working on a battle bot. That's for my husband. He loves that. They enjoy it. Makes me happy. I understand enough. And I will go to like a battle bot show because that mess is fun. I digress once again. World changers. I had a blast today. I don't know if you can tell. I had so much fun. I want you guys to know learning through play, it does not take a lot of time. It really just takes practice and intentionality. You can spark that light within your sugar. It doesn't have to happen when they go to school. That can be you. You can start that process. And even if you're not the one that can start that process, you can be the one to nurture them, learn it, understand it, relate to them, and just give them the tools that they need in order to just push to purpose. It doesn't require a big budget or thousands of dollars of toys to expose your sugar to meaningful things. It just takes you and intentionality. In my upcoming book, Watch Me, Connecting to Your Child Through Play, I go into more detail about like very simple steps that we can take as world changers to connect, grow, and learn with our sugars. We want to do it now. We want to do it now. We don't want to wait until they're big as we are to start trying to make these connections and understand who our sugar is. Let's be collective from day one. Continue to join me on this journey. Visit my website at I'vegotthiskid.com. Go to the grow section and sign up for the interest list. And, and I'll hook you up. That's how I roll. Also, if you're not on my mailing list, what are you waiting for? Go sign up. If you're not my social media friend, please go become my friend on social media because I seriously want to know, like, what is it you guys are using out there that's completely upcycled that you've turned into a toy? I want to know. I want to learn. I'm always looking out for some good stuff. Become this part of the community because not only do we want to connect, grow, and learn for our sugars, we also want to be strong for ourselves as we go through this parenting process. Join us next week where we'll talk about you learn how. You see, I give the pause. If you're watching me on YouTube, I give like this serious pause and this serious face because again, we're all wired differently and how we're wired and how sugar is wired is just different. And so how we teach and how they learn may not always mesh together. And so we need to be proactive and know what that looks like and what the heck can we do to make sure that we're on the right track. So let's do this. Um, we've got to not only get ready to like make up for this 16 months that we were in quarantine, but eh, we want to be proactive for the summer and eh, we want to get them ready for the next school year. So let's, let's do this together, y'all. It's all about balance. So let's have fun, but let's be mindful about how much fun we're having and still build in some good stuff to make sure our sugars aren't falling behind because I want to make sure that our sugars are together. You don't want to miss this episode. Until the next time, world changers, take care.